get into some worship today, so if you can stand on your feet. everybody. Welcome to New Vintage. If it's your first time here, we're super excited that you decided to join us. So welcome. I hope you have a great day here today. My name is Sarah, and I've got a few, three quick announcements to share with you about some things upcoming that we're going to be doing. The first is my favorite thing that we do as a church, which is called Serve Day, and that's going to be on May 5th. So what we do on Serve Day, if you're new, is we actually cancel service in the church here, and we actually go do service in the community. It's really cool. We serve schools and other nonprofit organizations that serve the community. So we're showing the love of God with our works out in the marketplace. Um, with that, um, it's going to be Cinco de Mayo. So once we're done our work, we're going to come back and we're going to do a little taco party. But our biggest project that day is actually here. A lot of you all have been asking, well, we've been serving the community. Let's serve our church too. Can we beautify this place? And the answer is yes. So if you are good at construction like Jeff, or if you are good at painting like our friend Dana, um, or you like to plant uh, flowers and things like that, definitely sign up for that group. But there's about 13 different groups that are live on the website for you all to sign up for. So please definitely check that out and sign up. And thanks to those of you that have already joined my group. I love you very much. Um, with that, we also have our man night. <laughs> I feel like that's a must. You have to do that when you say man night. That's going to be on April 19th. Mark your calendars, guys. 
that's going to be a fun at Danny's house. You guys are going to eat, drink, be merry, and you're going to compete. I don't know what you're going to comp be competing with, but have fun with that. And don't worry, girls, we're going to have our own thing in May. Okay, so woo, woo, woo. <laughs> last but not least is the walk, which is our summer camp. That's going to be, I knew I would hear from you, Natalie. April 2nd, or August 2nd through 5th, and that is for middle and high schoolers, and it's only $475, which is actually pretty inexpensive for a summer camp. But we're looking for 300 kids to sign up for that, 300 students, which is a lofty goal, so definitely spread the word. Keep in mind, though, that $475 sometimes is a big hurdle for somebody, and we'll say that camp is actually very expensive for this church to put on, too, and we lose money on it every year. But we think that's a worthy cause to lose money for it because we're helping build up our next generation's faith, and we're um, helping them with their relationship with not only each other, but with God, and they're bringing that back to their schools and to their home. So if you don't have a middle or high schooler, and you're not able to volunteer, maybe you'd be willing to support the summer camp in another way, and that is, would you be willing to donate some money towards sponsoring a student? Maybe it's $100 a month, maybe it's the full 475 for one of the kids, but it's super easy to do. You're just going to go on our website, go to the Give button. There's a drop-down for Summer Camp Fund, and you can just donate there. Anything that you do is super helpful, and you're going to change lives. So with that, we're going to sing some more worship songs, if you guys will stand up. Maybe turn to your neighbor and tell them why you hate peeps as much as I do.
song called wait on you and i would just encourage you that you know if you're dealing with something holding on to something in your life um, god's not going to take it from you he wants you to give it it's not his to take it's yours to give and in that process when you do that there's a waiting period and i would just encourage you this morning to sing this out from your hearts i'm gonna wait on you and commit to that because god is working in your life he wants to move in your life amen hearts now. I don't believe in fairy tales. I guess I've outgrown them. That doesn't mean that I don't believe in something bigger than I've seen it in a hospital when the doctor says sorry. 
And there's nothing more we can do Well, it wasn't true And I've never seen a heart of gold At the end of a rainbow But I've got a promise I can hold In the middle of the struggle And if you say that you perform it May not be how I want you to Here's what I'll do I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you Tasted your goodness Trust in your promise I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you Tasted your goodness Trust in your promise I'm gonna wait on you I know you are the greatest. You are the only. There's no predicting what is next. You hold the future and all the questions that come second to the one that I know is true. You've always been true. I'm gonna wait on you. Give him a shout of praise this morning. Y'all sound beautiful. You may have a seat.
Good morning. Welcome to church the week after Easter. You came back. You made it. He's back and you're back. So glad to see you. My name is Darren, and if I haven't met you yet, uh, Danny, did I get you on that? I don't know. Danny's laughing. Uh, Danny's nickname is Fun Danny, though, so it's, he's always going to be having a good time. So uh, I'm glad that you're here. If I haven't met you, I'd love to meet you. We have a red carpet in the back because the red carpet is VIP for you that are here for the first time. We have a gift for you, and I'd love to get to know your name. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, just a quick reminder, if uh, you've been here the last four or five weeks, we've been talking about foster care quite a bit. We really want to help find more foster families for kids in our community. Uh, this area needs 40 more families. We'd like to be able to do one. And so we'd like to participate with one or two. So after this, this service uh, in our chapel, there's a meeting for uh, anyone interested in learning more about the foster care system, how you can either foster someone or you can support a foster family uh, with meals and help and service. So we'd love for you to check that out. Uh, a big day today. Um, it's uh, our second to last, third to last Sunday before Serve Sunday and before we move to three services. So we're moving to three services soon. We have nine people in six chairs on the front row, just so you know. These are our high school students. This is not to code, all right? It's not to code. But when you're in high school, you want to be close to each other, you know? You just, there's a lot of love happening in high school. Uh, I'm, just, I'm not saying any of you are in love. I don't know your stories. But um, yeah, we're packing it in in here, and so um, we are going to move to... And so just a real quick... Uh, time change, it's going to be, everyone has to move. There's a, there's a different time for everybody. So it's going to be 8.30, 10, and 11.30. If you're an 11 o'clock attendee, we want to ask you to consider moving to the 11.30. What we'd like to do is move our two services to the, the bookends, you know, as much as possible, because we think 10 o'clock is going to be like our prime time, all right? That's going to be, for, the, for people who are new or getting invited, that's going to be the time. It doesn't mean none of you can come to the 10 o'clock. That's what I'm saying, okay? But I'm saying nobody come to the 10 is what I'm trying to say, all right? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, but you know, it's because of, we don't know how it's going to go, how it's going to shake out. We'd love for you to consider at least trying one of the outside services to re leave room in the middle for uh, people that might see that as the optimal time to bring their family. Now, you can see this room is pretty full. It's hard to find a seat once everybody's up and standing and, and all that kind of thing. So um, if, you, if you're in here now, if you, uh, you know, if you, if you like it packed uh, for a couple weeks, for a while, it's going to feel like it's, nobody's here. And you're going to be like, the church is dying. It's not dying. We're moving to three services, okay? And so we want to make room for people so it's easy to find a seat. When you come and you're here for the first time, you want to feel like they, they made room for me. There's a space for me here at this place. We want to create that, which means there's no better time then now for you to jump into serving somewhere as well. And you're thinking, uh, here we go again with the serving thing. You've told me 72 times, I'm still not doing it, bro. I'm not going to break today. You're going to break at some point, all right? <laughs> and here's why. Uh, I've heard it said that a church is a family. Now, sometimes it's a family. Sometimes it feels like a business. Sometimes it feels like a hospital for the hurting. It's all those things. But in one aspect, it's a family. And in my house, in my family, I've heard it said that uh, when guests come over to our house, we don't make them serve anything. When guests show up, I'm not like, all right, could you get on the mop, you know? Could you sweep? Because we're not ready for you. It, it, my kids had to sweep earlier because they're part of my family and we're hosting people. I, I have to get the food ready. I have to cook the food. Uh, my kids have a room to clean. There, there's a role and responsibility in the family to get ready for guests. And if you aren't currently serving at this church, it may mean you haven't really stepped into making it your family yet because what we do as a family here is we get this place ready for the guests. We get it ready for the people. This isn't my church, it's our church, and we would love for you to be a part of the family, the team that gets it ready, because we believe there are still thousands and thousands of guests that will walk in these doors. Many of you here for the first time today going, what's this place all about? What is this, I've, I've heard rumblings that, that there might be a place where I could be loved, come as I am, come with all my, my struggle, my mess, my questions. We gotta create that place, so if you are ready to make this your place, we'd love for you to wake up some of the sleeping spiritual gifts that have sat dormant for a while and step into serving. It's not just about we need you to serve, you need you to serve. You need you to step into what God's calling you to do because you have more to do. You have more purpose, you have more passion, there are more friends for you to make, there's more for you to do by stepping in and serving. So we'd love for you to consider sitting for a service and serving for a service. We'd love for you to think about that. If you haven't done that yet, you can say yes at our Say Yes wall on the back. All you have to do is click a button, and someone will get back to you as well. So um, we'd love for you to do that. 
We are, um, we're studying the book of John together right now in a series called Prove It. The reason it's called Prove It is John starts the book in chapter one by saying that Jesus was God. Jesus is more than just a, a nice guy. Jesus is actually God. That's his claim in chapter one. And we've been doing two parts of every chapter. chapter uh, there's, one, uh, there's A and B of every chapter. And there will be a quiz at, at, uh, from time to time. Next week is your first quiz, just so you know. For you achievers out there, for you planners out there, next week is your quiz. There will be prizes. For those of you that hate school, you hate to fail and all that kind of stuff, you could just, if you flunk, we're not even going to care. We're not even going to, we're, we're going to kick you out, but we're not going to care. And so, uh, how many of you, by the way, just like taking quizzes and tests? You're kind of an overachiever. Some of you are in the crowd. There's, yeah, okay, yeah, there's one. Anybody else? Okay, the rest of you liars. Okay, so you hate this series. Everyone's like, this is the dumbest thing we've ever done. We don't want to take your quizzes, bro. Too bad. You're getting a quiz next week, all right? Next week, we're going to do a quiz uh, over the first four chapters. So let me give you a quick review, okay? There will be prizes. There will be something for you to win. 1A, God became a man. That's the statement. That's the claim. That's how it all starts. 1B, the team begins to form. The reason there was a team, because chapter 1, verse 10 says Jesus came to the world, but the world didn't recognize him. So a team had to form to help the world see and know Jesus. That's the idea of chapter one. Chapter two, water into wine. The Sonoma County miracle happened, right? He turned water into wine. I heard a joke the other day. Um, uh, they, uh, somebody was pretending to be Jesus, and he, said, and he was a comic, a comic, and he said something along the lines of, uh, Jesus, uh, you've had too much to drink. We're cutting you off. We're only giving you water from now on. And Jesus was like, oh, no, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, so <laughs> stupid joke, stupid joke. All right. That's chapter 2a. Chapter 2b, Jesus flips the tables. We must protect this house in the temple. These two things in chapter 2, John is claiming that he has, a, he has power over, th over nature and he has authority over the church. That's, that's his claim in chapter 2. Chapter 3, we see Nick at night, born again. We, hear this, we see this guy come talk to Jesus at night. And Jesus says, it's not about who you are. It's about, it's about the spirit in you. You need to be born again. And some of you raised your hand and said, yes, I want to be born again. I want to I say yes to Jesus. And if you did that a couple weeks ago, we want to follow up with you. And the way that we're going to do that is at our Say Yes Wall after service, we have a booklet for you. We have a four-week study guide for you called Next Steps that we wrote for anyone who would say yes to Jesus. Just here's what you do next. Here's some things to study to make sure that your faith begins to grow. We don't want to leave you hanging. Uh, so grab one of those books. Talk to Robin and Dell back there at the table, and they'll help you make sure you get connected in all the ways you need to get connected. We'd love for you to continue on that journey. And then 3B, at the very end, John the Baptist says, more of him, less of me, signed JTB. Now, if you're here for the first time, who is JTB? What are these nicknames? That's just our shortening of John the Baptist. It's just a really cool way to say it. Anyway, it's not that cool. I made it up, so I'm claiming it's cool. But... So JTB is John the Baptist uh, when we see him in this. So more of him, he says, there's got to be more of Jesus, less of me. And that's where we pick it up then in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is the story of, uh, of the woman at the well that maybe you've heard about before. And there's a lot of lessons in this story for all of us. And so in order for us to kind of recognize that there's lesson after lesson after lesson, and lessons that aren't so obvious, but kind of a little bit like, you know, interesting, I've titled this one, chapter 4a, Well, Well, Well. Well, well, well. Look what we have here. Interesting chapter right here. It's an interesting chapter, uh, and I saw somebody taking a, a screenshot of it. Uh, presumably that's to cheat next week uh, on the quiz. And so, um, well, 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 it's chapter 4A. And that's where we'll jump in today. If you have your Bible, you can go to John chapter 4. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. We'll read a lot of this uh, together. And um, I hope that it is encouraging for each one of you today. Let me pray for us. God, I just pray that as I uh, speak today, that you would help me to, um, to speak well, uh, to say what you want me to say. I pray that you would give us ears to hear. I pray that your word would, would speak to us. And God, I pray that every person in this room who's wondering if they matter, uh, if their life has value, if uh, they're in the wrong place today, like why'd we show up here? I pray that there'd be something in the next few minutes that would be helpful and encouraging uh, and of value to each person in the room. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, all right, chapter, one, uh, chapter four, verse one. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them. His, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. This, this part just means that, uh, you know, in, in chapter uh, three, 
you saw John the Baptist, his disciples saying, hey, he's, he's baptizing all these people. He's gaining notoriety. The Pharisees recognize this too. And Jesus knows it's not my time yet. Just like he told his mom at the wine thing, and his mom was like, yeah, it's going to be your time tonight, buddy, so make it anyway. Uh, he says, it's not my time, so I can't let these Pharisees get me into a big conflict right now in Judea. It's not time. So he left to kind of get away from all that. It's John's way of low-key saying, like, Jesus knew what was going on. Jesus was in charge of the plan. He wasn't going to let them be in charge of him. So Jesus kind of has authority. He's like, we got to get out of here. I know what they're doing. So they go. And, they, and, and when they leave Judea in the south, the southern region, they're headed north to Galilee. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but walking in the Bible times, if you read all the places they went, like first he went here and then he went there, you think, oh, he got on the moped, he got on the bike, he got on, No, he walked. And we're talking 25 to 200 miles sometimes. Like we're talking like long, long walks, days walks that they would take. And so this walk, he, he, he goes, we got to go north, and we're going to go through Samaria. That's where we're going to go. In fact, verse 4 says he had to go through Samaria on the way. Let me just tell you this. He did not have to go through Samaria on the way. Uh, and you go, oh, oh, you think you know so much, Pastor Boy. It says right there in the Bible he had to go through Samaria. What I mean is Samaria was not a place that most Jews wanted to walk through to get to Galilee. They would take a different route. The reason being is that in Samaria lived this group of people called the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were a mixture ethni ethnically of Jewish people and Assyrians and Babylonians and others. What happened is hundreds of years previously, the Assyrians had wiped out the Jewish uh, and, and took them into captives, the, the Jewish nation. And then uh, Babylonians then took the, the southern half, Judea, uh, into captivity. And so what was left was these remnants of, of Jewish people, but then they would intermarry with the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and other nations. And when the Jewish population came back to this region, uh, the purebred Jews looked at these people as half-breeds. You guys sold out, and you, you are not true to our faith and our religion. Because they did have some, the Samaritans did have a view of temple worship, and they did have a view of messianic a God of, 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 with a Messiah. And they had some similarities, but they weren't exactly the same. And so there was this big racial, religious tension between the two. They hated each other. There was a, you know, a lot of hatred. So Jewish people were so smug about it that they wouldn't even pass through their town, even though it was a faster route. They'd go all the way around. And so it says here he had to go through Samaria on the way. Well, he didn't have to geographically, which means there must be another reason he had to. And I think the reason he had to was because he had some lessons at the, well, well, well. He, he, had, to, he, had, he had an appointment already set up. He had a divine appointment ready to go. He, he knew there was something he had to do there. He had to shake things up. He had to change the way people saw the world. And he's going to change everything in just a few moments here. He's going to begin to change the whole narrative of faith, the whole narrative of, of gender, uh, the, uh, the, the, the value of the genders. He, he's going to change a lot of things in this moment. And so chapter uh, 4, verse 4 says he had to go through Samaria on the way. Well, eventually, verse 5, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son. This, this place has a lot of history. His son Joseph. A lot of history in the Old Testament in this very spot. A lot of things went down right here, and another one's about to go down. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. So it's hot. He's been walking quite a ways, and he's tired. And I'm so glad John put this in there. That Jesus was tired. He knows what tired feels like. But wait a second, he's, he's God and he's man. He can do miracles. Why not just, you know, hit his ankle and level the battery back up? Why not just hit some button and be like, Brrr, I'm good? Why wouldn't he do that? If you watch the miracles of Jesus, if you look at all of them, every miracle goes outward. There's no miracle where he goes inward to help himself, to relieve his own pain to relieve his own feelings. Why? Because we have a God who is familiar with our struggles. And he wants to sit in it and feel it here and know what it means to be tired. So he can relate to you. People in the room, I don't know who you are watching online. I don't know what your story is, but I know some of y'all are tired. You're tired from your addiction. You're tired from your marriage. You're tired from your kids. I know you're tired from your kids. You're tired from striving, you're tired from work, you're tired from stress, you're tired from finances, you're tired from feeling lonely. You got all kinds of tired in the room. I just want you to know, just for a moment, a brief stop at the well, 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 Jesus stops to say, I know what it is to feel tired. 
and I know when you're tired. And he says later in another place, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. We talked about it last week at Easter. The reason the Sabbath wasn't a part of the New Testament was because the Sabbath represented rest. And Jesus now represents rest. He's our source of rest at this point. He says, come to me, I'll give you the rest. He knows we get tired. He's felt tired. I'm so glad John put that little nugget in there to say Jesus felt what you feel. He knows it. He gets it. When you talk to him about being tired, you don't have to be like, let me explain tired to you, Jesus. He goes, I know, I know tired. Just say, I'm tired. Would you give me rest? Just talk to him about you're tired. So he, verse 6 is about him being tired. Verse 7, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. So notice right here, he says, Jesus says to her, okay, a Samaritan woman comes out. Now, in, in, in those days, women were seen as property, okay? Now, I know some of you are offended right now, all right? What would you say? Okay, in those days, they were less than. In that culture, in, in that time, women were seen as subservient to. And we know this because even in the Old Testament, when it talks about um, coveting in the, in the Ten Commandments, it says don't covet your neighbor's house or their possessions or their stuff, right? It gives a list of things. And then it says, or covet your neighbor's wife. She's listed in a list of possessions because she's seen as a possession. She was traded for a dowry of some kind. You know, we give this gift so we get your daughter, like, into our family. And, and, and so they're, they're not, rabbis wouldn't talk to women. And certainly a Jewish rabbi would never talk to a Samaritan woman, he would never say something to her. This would have been unheard of, and they knew it. In fact, husbands oftentimes wouldn't talk to their wives in public to walk behind me. Now, some of you, that feels, that feels good. You're, you're like, That's, that sound, do, can we bring that? Are we allowed to? It's because you're sinners, all right? Because you're sinners, you need, you need Jesus, all right? But in those days, he would have never talked to her. And so I want you, I want you to stop for a second and say, uh, people in the room, if, if anyone ever, ladies in the room, if any of you feel like, if, you, if you're asked the question, isn't, isn't the Christian faith like sexist and, and chauvinistic and, um, you know, isn't it anti-women and all this kind of stuff? You, you can say something like, well, maybe there might be people in the Christian faith who are acting that way, but not the guy who started it. The guy who started actually is so progressive with women. He's talking to this woman to make a point that you are equally as valuable as anybody else on the planet. Some of y'all, three o'clock today, have a date with your ESPN with Caitlin Clark against South Carolina. And the reason, the reason you have that date today is started right here. The reason that we value women started right here. If not for Jesus and the turn that he makes right here, does this ever happen? When's it gonna happen? He stands up in this moment and says, you're every bit as equal. I'm not interested in the way humans are humaning to each other. I'm going to show you how God does humanity. Because I made y'all and y'all have equal value. And one of the reasons we see each other as equal in value is because of what Jesus does on this very day that we're talking about. Doesn't mean we're not different. We're still different. Different is good. God made us with differences in genders. But he made us equal. And it's okay to be different. We're all different in lots of different ways, but we're all equal in our value. And Jesus is stating that with this conversation. He says, please give me a drink, right? And I love this. This is just another little tidbit, a little nugget that John drops to go, look, he doesn't just miraculously heal himself. He goes, I'm going to use nature the way that it's meant intended. I just need, I'm just going to get a drink. And so this is the funny part because um, uh, we're going to get to this place where he's, he's, again, he's talking about spiritual things, and she thinks it's a physical thing, just like Nicodemus where he said, you just, you know, you got to be born again. Uh, and he's like, how do I get back in her womb? You're like, I don't get it, right? And so here, here we go. Let's get to that part. So uh, please give me a drink. Verse 8, he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now let me just say real quick to that. That's probably because they were going to screw it up, all right? So he was like, you guys go. Uh, I have an appointment with someone. You guys are idiots. Uh, I love you. I love you. You're equally valuable, but you're going to screw this up for me, so go get some lunch or something. I think that's, I don't know. I, I'm putting that in the Bible, so you're not supposed to do that. So I'm just guessing. It's just guessing why he said, you know, get, get out of here, right? You guys go over there. Uh, I have something to do, and I, I don't think you guys get it yet. And we'll find out later that 
They, they don't get it. And, and so we'll see what, why I think that. So he was alone at the time because the disciples were gone. Uh, verse 9. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink? I can't emphasize this enough. People in the room who you think God wouldn't come to you because you're too far gone. You're not a church person. This is your first time back in a while. You cuss. You cuss good, too. You're good cusser. You got, a pro- you got a porn problem. You got a filthy problem. You got an anger problem. You got an addiction problem. You got a weed problem. You got a something problem. You're an angry person. You, 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 just, you don't even believe this stuff. This is, this is, yeah. God would never come to you because you just don't deserve it. I just tell you, Jesus comes to the Samaritan woman, and she goes, why are you coming to me? Why are you? Wh- I'm a, do you know I'm a Samaritan woman? And we're going to find something else out about her that makes her think even less of herself. We're going to find out that she's had five husbands and that she's with another man that's not her husband. And she's going, why would you ever come to me? And I love that John put chapter 3 right next to chapter 4 because in chapter 3, he's with Nicodemus, the religious elite, so holy, and he doesn't get it. And one chapter later, in the next story, he's with the religiously low, and she doesn't get it. And neither one of them understands, because he thinks that he is able to be with God because he's so good. And she thinks she could never be with God because she's so bad. And Jesus, John, in writing the story of Jesus, right here, puts them right next to each other to say, you can't good your way in, and you can't bad your way out. You can't good into the kingdom of God, and you can't bad out of the kingdom of God. There's nothing, nothing you can do to, to win my favor, because you were so great, and there's nothing so bad you could do that I would ever stop having favor for you. It's not about how good or how bad you are. Jesus is trying to say, it's about what I've got for you. I've got something for you to fix your situation. And so he puts them right next to each other. Chapter 3, chapter 4. Really good guy, really bad girl. And he says, neither one of you need to worry about your goodness or your badness. It's something altogether different. He goes, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. If you just knew If you just knew what I had for you to ask, and I would fill you up, I'd satisfy you. She goes, verse 11, she doesn't get it. I I love I love that people don't understand spiritual things. If you don't understand spiritual things, by the way, don't be like, don't, if you read this and you're like, I didn't get any of that, right? Don't be, uh, don't be too worried about it. A lot of people struggle to get the spiritual aspect of things. It's through asking God to help you that you get it. The, the, The spirit in you leads you. But she doesn't get it. Look, but sir, you don't have a rope with a bucket. What are you talking about? Well, living water. Where's your rope, bro? Where's your bucket? You can't get water out of this well. She said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get the, li- the living water? And besides, I love this question. Do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? <laughs> who do you think you are? I mean, Jesus, the self-control here. <laughs> I'd have been like, well, I made him. So, yeah, I do think I'm better. I'd have, I'd have got him. Jacob, come here. Come here. (laughs) Tell her. (laughs) You know, the self-control of Jesus, the humility of Jesus in this moment to just be like, I know you don't get it. You don't get it. Do you think you're better than Jacob? Actually, I do. I do. Right? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, verse 13, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. This water right here, this well water. If you drink this, you'll be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. She still doesn't quite get it. She says in verse 15, Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. Now, why was she at the well at noon by herself? In those days, you may have heard this, women would get water in the mornings, in the cool of the day, and it was their time at the watering hole to kind of chat it up. Like, hey, what's up, girl? How you doing? How's Obadiah? What's he up to? You know? (laughs) What's been going on? How's your family? Good, good. How's your washing machine? We don't have one. Oh, okay. (laughs) They would talk. They would chat. 
And, and, and they, would, they would socialize in the morning, and she's here at noon by herself. More than likely, she's one of the people they would talk about in the morning. Whatever her name was, you know, let's just call her, uh, you know, Elizabeth. Oh, yeah, did you hear about Elizabeth? She's on man number six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I think she met him on Tinder. Swipe right. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. It's weird, though. Yeah, they're, oh, yeah, I think they're, mm-hmm, it's not going good. I heard they were yelling outside the house last night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's going to leave her. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they were saying about her, but they, she wasn't welcome in the morning. She didn't feel welcome in the morning. She felt like an outcast, so I got to go at noon when nobody's going to be there. I got to go when, when, so she has no social life. And she's probably really desperate for friendship. She's probably really desperate to feel good about herself. She's probably pretty miserable. She's probably pretty sad, lonely, discouraged. And here she is talking to this guy who's talking about living water. And she goes, man, give me that. I'll never have to come back here again. And he says to her, go get your husband, Jesus told her. <laughs> go. I don't know why he asked her, maybe to see if she'd tell the truth, see what her character was like. But she goes, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. End of story. I, I, I don't have one. I don't, I don't have, why do you think I have a husband? I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, and this must have shocked her. Can you imagine? Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. I, if you're the woman at this point, <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't, I don't have a husband. I know you have five. Hmm? What? How did you know that? Right? And she, Jesus is bringing this, this personally to her home now to say, you got some things to work on. And she responds back to him, I know I'm so sorry, I'll change. I gotta get this out of my life. I gotta change. No, she doesn't. She says, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Tell me, why is it that the Jews insist on Jerusalem as the place of worship while we Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? He goes, hey, you're not living right. She goes, let's talk about where we should worship. <laughs> let's avoid me and let's just talk generally about faith. You guys ever done that before in your life at church? Maybe you come, you hear a message. Pastor Darren is very convicting. He poked at something that really you know you need to change in your life. And you get back to the car and you go, I didn't like the music today. <laughs> he wasn't as funny as he normally is, right? Yeah. And you debate something altogether different because it's poking at you. And you'd rather just deal with everything else than deal with what's going on in you. And Jesus is trying to say, girl, I want to help you. I want to help you. This, is, this faith thing is personal. It's personal. And, and, and just stop for a second and just say, I don't know your story. I'm not going to follow you around and check in on your sin habits. I don't have time and I am not interested. But you know you. And you know where it is that God's convicting you. You know what things in your life have to go and they need to go and you need to work on them and you're, you're dealing with everything but that. Can I just encourage you? Deal with it. And, and I'm gonna show you how to deal with it here in just a second. Jesus is gonna help her deal with it because Jesus is not primarily concerned about her sin. If you notice, he doesn't go into this, oh, whoa, whoa, what have you two been doing? Uh-huh, tell me about your dirty little sinful life you got going, lady. He doesn't. Because if you get nothing else here today, this, this is the whole point today. The whole point today is that God's not primarily concerned with her sin. It's not about how sinful she is. And she's sinful. She's thirsty. And he's here to deal with her thirst. Her problem isn't that she's sinning. Her problem is that she's feeling an emptiness. She's thirsty, and she wants to drink. She wants to satisfy the thirst, and she goes, maybe man number one, maybe man number two, maybe man number three. What's going to satisfy this thing in me that's so thirsty? And Jesus came to deal with her thirst, not necessarily her sin, though fixing the thirst will fix the sin. 
Because he's going, if I can just show you what's, what truly satisfies, you'd stop running to everything that doesn't. Because you'd be full. You wouldn't need to keep drinking somewhere else. You wouldn't need to be, keep looking somewhere else. You'd be satisfied. So Jesus comes and goes, ah, hey, girl, listen, 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 look here, look here, girl. Look here, Samaritan girl who has five husbands. You think you're so low? You think you're so bad? I had an appointment with you. I have a reason that I'm here with you, and I want you to know I came to give you life and give it to the full. It's not about just you being bad. It's about you being thirsty. And I have what will quench your thirst. That's the story of the Christian faith, y'all. It's not about sin management. It's about satisfying our thirst that's built into us by the God who made us, and he's the only recipe and the only answer for satisfying our weary, quenched soul. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet, right? She deflects. Jesus, verse 21, believe me, dear woman, the time's coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. I'm changing all that. You Samaritans, you know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews, we know all about him, for the salvation comes to the Jews. But the time's coming, indeed it's here right now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You're going to get the spiritual side of things. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. He's trying to get this, pass this on, that there's a spiritual element to life. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who's called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus in this moment decides to reveal himself, or maybe he's already known he's going to reveal himself, to this woman. Who does he choose? The first person on earth that he decides to say, I'm the Messiah, I'm him, is a Samaritan woman who's been with five guys and living with a sixth. What makes you so unqualified? You worse than that? You, you got something going on that's worse than that? I, God, God is not, he's not worried or scared of your big pile of sin. That he wouldn't come to you. That you're unworthy because of the way you've lived your life or you failed in some way. He can see, he can go right through all that. I always like to think about sin um, by the numbers. Uh, there's 12 billion people that have lived on the planet at some point, or give or take some, a couple billion, I don't know. So 7.7 .7 billion now, lots of people have died. Let's just call it 12 billion people. Let's say they lived an average of 40 years, okay? 40 years times 12 billion people, and, and there's 365 days. And let's say they sin twice a day. That's being very conservative, okay? Let's say you only sin twice a day. Some of you are way past done already today, right? <laughs> but let's just say two times a day, people sin. And we add all that up. We multiply it all out, okay? We've got 12 billion times two sins a day times 40 years times 365 days, okay? We're talking about this huge, this, the sin of the world fills up space. Like it's more than the stars in the heavens, right? And, and, and so let's, now let's take your sin, okay? Let's take your sin and your stuff that you're carrying right now, your, your addiction, your habit, your thing, your whatever, your anger, and let's, let's pluck it from the pile, can't see it. It's too small. And you're looking at it like it's some huge thing. How could God ever forgive me? He said he died for the sins of the whole world. Do you, have you ever thought about how many that is? That's a mini much mucho. And, and yours is like, it's nothing. Quit beating yourself up. Quit acting like you're so bad. You ain't that bad. You're not that bad. You're bad. <laughs> but you're not that bad. And he comes to this woman who thinks she's so bad. At the well, by herself. Nobody likes me. I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jewish rabbi. Why would you talk to me? And he goes, can I tell you something? I haven't told anybody this. I'm the Messiah. And the funniest thing happens, next verse, just then the disciples walk in. <laughs> Bad timing, dudes. <laughs> you ever walked into a conversation at the wrong time? You know, so it's real serious in the room. You walk in, you're like, hey, what's up? Okay. <laughs> That's that moment right there. Hey, what are you guys talking about? I just told her I'm the Messiah, you know? What are you guys doing? What, what's, what's going on? But look, he, we know that they, he, he probably kicked them out because just then the disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. See? They don't get it. Jesus is changing the game. Well, well, well. 
Well, 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 boys. Talking to a woman. How you like them apples? You like apples? How you like them apples? I'm talking to a woman who's a Samaritan. Let me tell you her story. What are you doing talking to her? Oh, because she's as valuable as you, boys. Her value is just the same. And I'm, I'm correcting what's been wrong for so long. But none of them want to say anything. John's writing this later going, remember that time we walked in and he just said he was a Messiah. And we were like, why is he talking to a woman? Woo, we were idiots. Like, well, I don't know why we did that, right? Verse 28, the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Apparently their conversation was longer than what John recorded. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, eat something. He says this thing that about my food is to do the will of the Father. Jump down the verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village so he had stayed for two more days. Long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. She becomes a hero in her village. She goes from a zero to a hero because of what Jesus does for her, dignifies her. And, and, and I just want to say this, she was, she was bad, okay? But I tell you what, when, when bad people, when people who have been you know, struggling. When they find what they're looking for, they're sometimes the best ones to point other people in that direction. The bad ones are often the best ones at telling everyone about the good one. So one, number one, don't give up on people. That person, your family, you're praying for, they're so bad, oh, they might just become a great saint. And that, that, that in you, if you're here, you got dragged here, you're such a bad person. You have a past, you have a record, you have a history. If we background checked you, it wouldn't be pretty. A few of you in the room. You think you're disqualified. Man, I'm telling you what, when, when one beggar finds bread, they tell all the other beggars. We found it. You gotta come see this. You know what? I'd rather have a church full of beggars who found bread than people who've been eating healthy for the last 40 years. Because if you've been fat and happy for 40 years, you kind of don't tell anybody about it. It's like, eh, I mean, I come to church, whatever. I'm here, I've been doing this since I was a kid. Kind of boring, kind of tired, kind of done with it. Man, I'd rather have a bunch of beggars who just found bread. Because they're going to go tell everybody in the streets. They're going to leave these seats, go to the streets and say, I got you got it, you got to come find it. I found, she went back, she said, I was thirsty, and he showed me where to find water. I was hungry, he showed me where to eat. He brought me what I needed. I've been looking for it everywhere. I've been looking in men, I've been looking in, in, for friendship, I've been looking for it all over, but I've met the one who can satisfy my spirit. When you meet the one who really satisfies your spirit, you tell people, because all your homies and you have been looking for it together at the bars and at the parties and out there at the work and the job and the, and the money and the financial meetings and you've been looking for it and you're all kind of in the same boat and you find it, you go, dude, 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 I might be onto something. I've been going to this church and God's been like moving. I know that's weird, I know, right? You should come check it out. Not right now. Well, just wait. Their life will fall apart in some way and then you bring them over. <laughs> I'm not saying pray their life falls apart, but I have done that before. Let them feel their need, Lord. Here's the lesson for chapter 4a, the woman at the well, well, well. Which, by the way, whenever someone mentions the woman at the well, you'll know it was John 4 for the rest of your life now. <laughs> woman at the well, John 4, well, well, well. Here's the lesson at the well, well, well. The Samaritan woman, we're her. You're her. I'm her. I'm thirsty. You're thirsty. And you got a sin problem. I got a sin problem. But that's not my big problem. My problem is I'm thirsty. And I'm looking to quench it. And sin is just some of the stuff I try to quench it. And it doesn't work. <laughs> and so today the encouragement would be put down the things that aren't working and pick up the one that will. Spend time with the one who can quench your thirst. Find Jesus. God says, seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. Go chase him. Figure out a way to chase him. Spend time with him. Read your Bible. Pray. Ask questions. Get in a group. Say yes to something at the church. Serve. Get plugged in. Chase him. He's the only one that quenches the thirst that you have. Now he will quench it. You are the woman at the well. 
I am the woman at the well, thirsty, longing for someone to show me where to quench my thirst. It goes on in chapter 4 at the end. This is very quick. Uh, there's just a little part at the end, 4B, where he heals a guy. And I kind of like that. Uh, he heals this, this son of, of a guy that comes will you, and says, will you heal my, my son? In verse 50, he says, and Jesus told him, go back home. Your son will live. I got it. I love that John, he's writing this along. He's like, oh, there's this incredible scene with Nicodemus, incredible scene with this woman. He, uh, he healed a guy. That was cool. Like, he's just sort of like used to these healings. He's starting to get used to Jesus healing people. He goes, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, and then he healed a guy. <laughs> okay, let me keep reading, keep writing now. So 4A is well, 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 and 4B is the second miracle, a son is healed. That's the second miracle he talks about. A son is healed. NBD, no big deal. <laughs> oh, yeah, he healed a guy. Thanks. That's cool. That's actually kind of a big deal. He just kind of tacks it on there at the end. So 4A is the big part of this chapter, though, the woman at the well, and then Jesus heals. He's in the healing mode in this chapter, healing her heart and healing a, a son's body. He's got authority over your spirit. He's got authority over our physical lives as well. So uh, your homework this week, pretty easy stuff this week. Number one, read chapters five and six. We're gonna really go for two chapters the next week, I promise, and then probably not. Uh, <laughs> two, tell your village. Who are your people that need to hear? Tell somebody. God loves them. He's got what they need. And number three, this might be the hardest part for some of you, love yourself no matter your story. Some of y'all will have a hard time with that this week. You will beat yourself up and beat yourself up and beat yourself up. Stop it. Stop beating yourself up. Your sin is hard to see compared to all the sin he's willing to forgive. It's not that bad. You're not that awful. Love yourself this week. God loves you. Why shouldn't you? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for this story. Thank you for John taking the time to write it down. Oh, the stories. He says there's more. You couldn't even tell them all. Thanks for the ones he did. Would you help us to remember, God, that uh, when we're acting out in some way that's not right or good, it's because we're thirsty. And we need to go to the one who can quench the thirst. And we need to talk to you. We need to invite you into the story. Thank you, God, that you don't hold our sin against us. You didn't uh, pummel this woman for her awful ways. You just told her where to find the living water that will quench her thirst. Help us to find it. Help us to love others. Help us to point the way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thanks for coming. If you want to get a Next Step booklet, they're at the Say Yes table. If you want to get that for your next steps in faith, and then there's a meeting right now for foster care in the chapel. Have a great day.